At our lunchtime lecture today, uh, we are delighted to be joined by Jocelyn Bose, uh, who is lecturer of intellectual property and information law at King's College in London, where her research focuses on the law and politics of plant intellectual property and biodiversity regulations. So um, we have a fantastic talk lined up uh, for you today, um, looking at some of the legislation, some of the more controversial legislation associated with botany. So so with no further ado, I'll hand you over to Jocelyn. Thank you so much. We're off to a good start because I remembered to unmute myself. Um, so thank you very much, everyone, um, for coming along today. And thank you to the Linnaean Society for the very kind invitation to speak and to share um, this uh, research that's in progress. Um, I really appreciate all the work that went into this. So thank you so much to Padma for your efforts and also Steph for giving your time to um, chair today. So the talk that I am giving today is taken from a work in progress, which explores the role of botanical expertise in legal decision making. It spends some time on criminal law, but most of the focus will be on plant intellectual property. And so I want to say a few words about that before we get into the case studies themselves. So plant intellectual property is a very broad term. Um, in the paper and in the talk today, what I'll mostly be focusing on um, is a unique form of intellectual property that is found in the United States called plant patents. Now, these were created with the enactment of the Plant Patent Act of 1930 to offer protection to breeders who develop new varieties of plants. Another form of protection for plant varieties called plant breeders rights is available in many countries around the world, including the United States, a double up that perhaps just exists to make things complicated. Now, although I have been referring to plant patents and plant breeders rights as forms of intellectual property, many legal commentators have pointed out that they are not always accepted as such. Brad Sherman highlights how these protections occupy an awkward position and are treated as outsiders that are begrudgingly tolerated in the field of intellectual property. This dubious view is bolstered by the relatively small number of plant patents and uh, plant variety protection certificates that are granted, as well as the sparse lit litigation when compared to other forms of intellectual property like uh, patents, trademarks and copyright. Margaret Llewellyn and Mike Adcock suggest that this outsider status has a lot to do with the fact that plant intellectual property is unmistakably a hybrid, having one foot in the intellectual property law family camp and a foot firmly within the territory of plant breeding and agriculture in particular, which has led many to question whether plant variety rights are intellectual property or even law at all. Now, some reasons for this are institutional, um, while other forms of intellectual property are administered by intellectual property agencies like the US and, uh, Patent and Trademark Office or USPTO, plant breeders' rights are usually awarded by agriculture departments, to use one example. Now, what these ideas about plant intellectual property reveal and what I hope to challenge with these case studies are certain assumptions about science, law and the relationship between them. One assumption is the idea that law and science are completely separate domains that can be clearly de demarcated from one another. Embedded within this are popular ideas about the timescales on which the two domains operate. The view is that science and technology is always rapidly forging ahead, while the law cannot keep pace and lags behind, belatedly regulating amidst pressures to reform, lest it become irrelevant or worse, harmful to the progress of science. We see this in rhetoric about plant intellectual property through the criticism that it has an outmoded focus on plant phenotypes when the science has shifted much of its attention to genetics. However, as scholars in law, science and technology studies have illustrated, these narratives about law and science, though widespread, do not always hold up under scrutiny. Scholarship on the history and practices of plant breeders' rights, such as the studies by Hamish MacDonald on the Australian plant breeders' rights system, show that the relationship between law and science is often better viewed as what Sheila Jasnoff terms co-production, that science and law are mutually constitutive, 
for example, plant intellectual property and the taxonomy of cultivated plants have inex are inextricably linked by their shared project to standardize the generic names of plant varieties as evidenced by the cross-pollination between the rules contained in the International Code of Nomenclature for Cultivated Plants and that in plant breeders' rights legislation. Furthermore, part of the reason why plant intellectual property is often viewed as less legal is that it is botanists and plant breeders who conduct technical examination of plants to answer legal questions about plant varieties, such as judging whether the, the varieties are new and distinct compared to others of its species, well before any government agencies or courts are called upon to assess whether intellectual property protection should be granted or has been infringed. Now with those seeds planted, let's turn to the case studies that I promised you, which partially confirm, but also in some ways challenge, this line of scholarship I have discussed above. The case studies center on two very different plants, one being marijuana or cannabis sativa, and the ayahuasca vine or Banisteriopsis carpi. They also focus on different areas of law, crime and intellectual property but they are united by the fact that the expertise of botanists and the science of taxonomy were used to argue that these two plants were outside the proper scope of these laws. The first dispute arose in the 1970s after President Richard Nixon declared a war on drugs, during which the criminal laws in the United States and many other countries were amended to increase the restrictions on possession, transfer or sale of marijuana. While facing prosecution under these new prohibitions, numerous American defendants raised something that later became known as the botanical defense, an argument that relied on the expert testimony of botanists to contest the classification and nomenclature of the genus cannabis. The second dispute arose in the 1990s, when a plant patent for a variety of Banisteriopsis carpi came to the attention of indigenous groups from the Amazon rainforest. Advocates for indigenous rights and environmental protection viewed the patent as misappropriation of the sacred ayahuasca vine and opposed the grant of the plant patent using expert statements from botanists and evidence from herbarium specimens. Now these case studies also have another point of connection. Much of the scholarship in law science and technology studies, which explores the role of scientific expert advice and testimony, focuses on instances where the law is trying to legislate or decide cases about recent scientific discoveries or new technological developments that have uncertain consequences for society. Yet there had not really been a new development in taxonomy that made botanical expertise suddenly become relevant for decision makers. Cannabis is one of the oldest known cultivated plants in the world and has been used by humans for thousands of years as a source of fiber, oil, and of course, a psychoactive drug. Likewise, the ayahuasca vine had been important to indigenous communities in the Amazon rainforest as an essential ingredient in the ayahuasca brew long before colonization, let alone the uh, plant patent. Instead, what had changed and triggered a response from botanists was the way the law sought to control the circulation of these plants. For marijuana, it was the recent changes to the legal environment in the 1960s and 70s, notably the development of international drug treaties, coupled with legislative changes and increased enforcement, that spurred botanists to re-evaluate scientific evidence that was decades, and in some cases, centuries old. In formulating the botanical defense, the criminal cases precipitated a controversy amongst botanists about the taxonomy of genus cannabis that is still bubbling to this day. Meanwhile, the grant of the ayahuasca plant patent fed into an existing controversy about intellectual property rights to plants and bolstered criticism of the patent system as a mechanism for the misappropriation or biopiracy of plant diversity and knowledge from indigenous peoples and nations in the global south. Now, both of these case studies require some important context. During the mid 20th century, there were, of course, major shifts in the public understanding of plants as drugs and medicines. Some of this was shaped by progress in the science of chemistry. Cannabis had posed a challenge for 19th and 20th century chemists who sought to extract and identify the active compounds of the plant, 
Thus, it was not until 1964 that researchers successfully isolated the molecule tetrahydrocannabinol or THC and reported that it was the main psychoactive component of marijuana. Alongside the progress in the field of chemistry, the 1950s and 60s saw the dissemination of research by ethnobotanists like Richard Evans Schultz, whose reports described the properties of hallucinogens encountered during his expeditions through Mexico and the Amazon, including magic mushrooms and ayahuasca, as well as encounters with marijuana. These accounts were popularized by the advocates for the recreational use of drugs, such as Pro Professor Timothy Leary, and became caught up in the counterculture movements of the 1960s. Now, this increasing social use of drugs in the 60s was met with heightened enforcement of criminal prohibitions. Marijuana users and their lawyers, however, responded by developing many defense strategies, some which were more successful than others. These often included undermining the expert testimony of forensic chemists who used the recent discovery of THC to identify the plant material seized by law enforcement based on its chemical composition. The strategies to undermine the chemical evidence followed familiar patterns. Defense lawyers addressed issues like the expertise of individual chemists who appeared for the prosecution or disputed the reliability and precision of their methodologies. Furthermore, defense lawyers used provisions in the US Bill of Rights to challenge the constitutionality of the criminal prohibitions on marijuana, which was successful, albeit rarely, um, in the case of Leary and the United States. However, when the US Supreme Court sided with Timothy Leary in that case and declared part of the federal legislation unconstitutional, the US Congress took the opportunity to introduce a new framework for the criminalization of cannabis. The federal and state legislatures implemented a harmonized law called the Uniform Controlled Substances Act of 1970, which importantly for us prohibited, quote, all parts of the plant, cannabis sativa L. The legislative changes were soon coupled with heightened enforcement. President Nixon declared the war on drugs on the 17th of June 1971 and merged two existing government bodies to form the US Drug Enforcement Administration in 1973. These changes weren't limited to the United States, so at the international level, the United Nations Single Convention on Narcotic Drugs was amended by a 1972 protocol to expand international drug control measures, notably over the cultivation of cannabis. However, that treaty defined cannabis um, as any plant of the genus cannabis. It did not use a, um, an individual species name. With this enactment of the Uniform Controlled Substances Act, Lawyers and botanists who had been working together on other defense strategies in marijuana cases recognized an opening. The legislation prohibited one species by name, but how many species of cannabis were there? The lawmakers had assumed that the consensus amongst plant scientists was that genus cannabis contained only one species. So this statutory definition would cover all types of marijuana. Contrary to that expectation, Defense lawyers in these criminal cases brought forward testimony from botanists that actually the genus cannabis contained multiple other species, such as cannabis indica or cannabis ruderalis. Based on that evidence, the defendants argued the botanical defense, that since the prosecution could not prove beyond reasonable doubt that the marijuana seized by law enforcement was the species named in the statutory definition and not in the other species, the court must acquit. To understand how the lawyers and botanists were able to undermine the supposed scientific consensus, we must first cover some rudimentary plant taxonomy, with my apologies to the botanists in the room who did not need this part of the lecture. So when botanists study plants, they compare um, different features to classify them into groups. They look at things like flowering patterns, leaf shape, plant height, branching patterns, and so on. The groups of plants are then arranged in a nested hierarchical system of taxonomic ranks or taxa. Now, um, there's many different ranks, but for the purposes of this controversy, we only need to know about two, the ranks of genus and species. Below the rank of species, botanists sometimes classify subspecies or varieties based on minor differences between plants within the same species. Once classified, each taxon must be given a name. Botanists have developed a set of rules for naming plants, 
which at the time of the cannabis controversy were called the International Code of Botanical Nomenclature. The most basic rule of botanical nomenclature is that species names have two parts, the genus name, such as cannabis, and the species epithet, such as sativa. Now to formulate the botanical defense, the lawyers and botanists sought to show that many experts in fact classified the genus cannabis into multiple species, each of which had different names in accordance with the nomenclature code, and not all of which were captured by the definition in the legislation. And to support this, they compiled evidence of three main species of cannabis, which we will look at briefly now. The first was cannabis sativa, a name which also helps us to illustrate some aspects of the nomenclature code. The two-part naming system for plants was popularized by a Swedish botanist named Carl Linnaeus, after whom the society is of course named. But there is more to the system than names merely having two elements. A fundamental logic behind the nomenclature code is to ensure that each species has one and only one name. Botanists do not want synonyms for the same plant that might cause confusion or make it harder to communicate about plants. For this reason, the nomenclature code has rules to resolve disputes where there are multiple names given to a single plant, including the rule of priority, that if more than one name has been given to a species, the name that was published first in time takes priority, and any names that were published later are illegitimate synonyms. However, when it comes to deciding which name has priority, botanical time does not go back um, eternally, but rather it starts with the publication of Linnaeus's book called Species Plantarum in 1753. In that book, he included a lot of pre-existing names, one of which was cannabis sativa. So we have a copy nicely here that you can see, and cannabis sativa is down here. However, this name um, was not created by Linnaeus. It had been used for many years, long before he published it. Um, sativa here means, um, is Latin for sown, planted, or cultivated. But despite this long-standing use of this Latin name, because publications before Linnaeus are not factored in, this is the, um, the book that is considered the authority for it. Now, to help keep track of priority, the nomenclature code used to require something called the author citation. So you will notice, for example, that at the end of the name Cannabis Sativa, we have a capital L. This is an abbreviation for Linnaeus, the author of the name. Now, as an aside, some American defendants before the botanical defense was developed argued that if arrest warrants or criminal charges did not include the author citation as it appeared in the legislation, this would uh, render their arrest invalid. So for example, as you can see on the slide, in the case of the state of Missouri against Thompson in 1968, the police officers had testified that they had identified the package which they saw the defendant throw from his auto and which was found by the police laboratory to, technician to contain 2.59 grams of cannabis sativa known as marijuana. In that case, Thompson unsuccessfully argued that the police laboratory evidence did not satisfy the elements of the charge because it did not identify the prohibited material as named in the legislation. The court, however, was quick to find that the difference was not consequential and that there is no doubt that cannabis sativa L and cannabis sativa are one and the same. The second name that came up in the cannabis controversy um, was um, the name cannabis indica. Now, indica is Latin for Indian, so a lot of plants and animals that European colonialists collected from the Indian subcontinent are given this species epithet. The French naturalist Jean-Baptiste Lamarck coined the name cannabis sativa in 1785 using samples from India and distinguished it from cannabis sativa based on eight morphological characters, describing it as shorter with more branching and a stronger smell, but noted that the species did not produce the hemp fibers that made cannabis sativa commercially valuable. Lamarck noted that the principal effect of this plant consists of going to the head, disrupting the mind, where it produces a sort of intoxication that makes one forget one's sorrows and produces a strong gaiety. To induce this gaiety, the Indians extract the resin from the leaves and the seeds, and by mixing it with the bark, make a drink which stimulates the senses a lot. Finally, the botanists Nikolai Vavilov and Dmitry Janishevsky both studied the variation of cannabis throughout the Soviet Union and Afghanistan. 
In 1922, Vavilov classified a group of wild cannabis as a variety called Cannabis sativa variety spontanea. However, Januszewski, and unfortunately I could not find a photo of him, Januszewski elevated it to the level of species and gave it the name Cannabis ruderalis in 1924. The word ruderalis uh, means weedy or growing among waste, chosen to describe marijuana plants which were shorter, usually less than two feet tall, and exhibited sparse branching compared to Cannabis sativa or Cannabis indica. The name Cannabis ruderalis was used in scientific texts in the Soviet Union, but was largely unknown outside of Europe until it was raised in the criminal proceedings in the 1970s. So, the defendants had found some published names, but were these names valid? Well, since the 1930, the nomenclature code had required that a plant specimen must be designated as the type by the author of the name when it is published. Of course, though, all of the names that I've just mentioned were published before this requirement came in. Now, the type specimen is dried, affixed to a labelled sheet of paper, and then deposited in a museum or herbarium. Despite the name, it is not meant to be typical of the species, but rather it is a randomly chosen specimen that is only accidentally and not essentially a representative sample of the species. The legal debate over the cannabis taxonomy in the 1970s exposed that no type specimen had been assigned for any of the putative cannabis species. Thus, the botanist William Stern was prompted to examine the materials that informed Linnaeus's original classification. And in 1974, he assigned a pistolate specimen as the type for cannabis sativa, which you can see on the left. The botanist who helped develop the botanical defense also identified specimens of cannabis indica, which you can see in the middle, which is housed in Paris. And they also found a specimen of cannabis ruderalis at the Vavilov Institute in the Soviet Union. Now, in the cases, the prosecution and defense were arguing for two different views of the genus cannabis. On the one hand, you have the prosecution's view of cannabis as a genus with only one species. But as we have already seen, several species names had been published. But since cannabis sativa was published first, it had priority and would be the legitimate name for all plants in the genus cannabis if we took this monotypic view. Nevertheless, the defendants emphasize that taxonomy is a science. And so over time, botanists may conduct further studies, look at specimens from different geographical areas and determine that the boundaries of a species should change and perhaps be split into multiple species. If botanists recognize the distinguishing characteristics identified by Lamarck or Januszewski as sufficient to divide the genus into multiple species, then cannabis plants might also be named cannabis indica or cannabis ruderalis, which have priority in their respective groups. In this way, and I hope this visual is clear enough, what we see is that any disagreements about classification had the downstream effect of frustrating the demands of both law and science for stable and unambiguous nomenclature. So let's have a look at the cases. In the first case to advance the botanical defense, American defense lawyers for a client charged with importing marijuana from Afghanistan retained two botanists as expert witnesses, Richard Evans Schultz, who was then the executive director and curator of, the economic, of economic botany at the Botanical Museum at Harvard University, and also William M. Klein of the Missouri Botanical Garden. Schultz reported that he had begun to question this monotypic view of cannabis while conducting a literature review in preparation for an invited lecture to the Institute for the Study of Drug Dependence in 1969, during which he gave a detailed survey of the work of botanists in the Soviet Union, as well as an outline of the numerous published species names, including cannabis ruderalis and cannabis indica. Now his change of view about the taxonomy became public after 1971, when def defense lawyers funded Schultz and Klein to undertake a field study of wild cannabis plants in their natural habitat in Afghanistan, as well as to examine specimens stored in herbarium collections and grown at an experimental site in Mississippi managed by the US National Institutes of Health. Following this research, the two botanists testified in the United States versus Rothberg that their conclusion was that the genus cannabis was polytypic, with at least three recognizable species, sativa, indica, and ruderalis. 
although their descriptions of these species differed in some ways from the geographical and other criteria for distinction that were employed by Lamarck, Vavilov, and Janiszewski. Since the US government had charged Rothberg with transporting marijuana from Afghanistan, Schultz and Klein argued that based on their recent field studies, that was the country of origin for cannabis indica, not the species cannabis sativa that was prohibited in the statute. Now, making the botanical defense entailed asking the courts to treat the meaning of the name cannabis sativa in the legislation as a question of fact to be resolved by reference to the testimony of expert witnesses. Taking as their premise the long-standing legal presumption that ambiguity in a criminal statute should be interpreted favorably to the accused, the botanists and lawyers rallied to expose the uncertain scope of the legislative definition. The defense lawyers argued that the marijuana prohibitions did not encompass the entire genus of cannabis and that the legislation should be interpreted narrowly to only proscribe one of the species. The next element of the argument um, depended on the fact that when botanists identify a specimen, they examine multiple features of the plant, such as the characteristics of its leaves, flowers, roots, and branching. But these features cannot be elucidated from cannabis material that is typically seized by law enforcement because the plant is often dried, crushed up, and otherwise not suitable for identification. Since the evidentiary burden lies with the prosecution to prove the elements of the offense, the defendants argued that the prosecution had not introduced sufficient evidence to prove beyond reasonable doubt that the botanical identity of the plant material possessed or sold by the defendants was in fact the prohibited taxon named in the statute rather than some other species. However, the defendants were up against the fact that for several years, the forensic identification of cannabis in legal proceedings had relied on the expertise of chemists. Thus, defense lawyers sought to draw the lines of authority to show that the testimony from chemists uh, attesting to the presence of THC in the plant material was not relevant. Given that THC is present in all plants of the genus cannabis, they argued that the different species of cannabis could not be distinguished based on chemical composition, regardless of the individual chemist training or the accuracy of their methodologies. The defense lawyers asserted that only botanists could give a true description of the variation of cannabis, and since chemists could not give a precise identification at the species level, their testimony did not offer a satisfactory rebuttal of the botanical defense. Now, of course, prosecutors did not allow this polytypic view to be argued without retort. Uh, in cases beginning with the United States versus Rothberg, the prosecution um, called uh, botanists like Ernest Small to testify that there was only one species of cannabis. Ernest Small had dedicated much of his career to the study of cannabis. He was retained as a research associate for the Canadian government's commission of inquiry into the non-medical use of drugs or the Ledane Commission um, in the early 70s and worked at the Canadian Federal Ministry of Agriculture for many years. During the 70s, he received funding from the United Nations to conduct research and attend conferences on drug control. And his work included a study of the variation in the levels of active compounds present in cannabis plants grown in Canada. Now faced with these competing views, the court sometimes called their own experts. Um, in the United States versus Rothberg, this court appointed expert was Arthur J. Cronquist of the New York Botanical Garden, who affirmed the general consensus position that cannabis was a monotypic genus. Although both Small and Cronquist recognized the diversity in the chemical composition and other features um, of cannabis plants, they argued that the differences were not sufficient to draw boundaries between species. At best, they could delimit varieties within the one species that arose due to environmental conditions or selective breeding by humans. So how did these cases shake out? Well, when study, uh, doing this study, I found that the botanical defense was published, uh, was, uh, uh, was argued in 59 published cases across um, the United States, Australia, and Canada. Out of those 59 cases, the botanical defense was successful once in the case of the United States versus Llewellyn. In that case, the, the judge accepted the polytypic view of cannabis and said that the decisive point seems to me 
um, is that those whose very function it is to weigh the significance of distinctions between plants within a genus, the plant taxonomists, consider the distinctions amongst cannabis sativa and cannabis indica sufficient to categorize them as different species. It does not seem to me decisive whether those engaged in botanical taxonomy had addressed and investigated this question deliberately and consciously and had arrived at some scholarly consensus prior to 1970 when Congress acted or whether this came later. However, this case was the exception. What the courts did in the other cases was to reject the idea that the meaning of the words cannabis sativa in the legislation was a question of fact that should be determined by reference to the testimony of experts. Instead, the courts asserted that it was a question of law and that the meaning to be accorded to the statute was for the court to decide and not for the dialectic of experts. Now, although acquittals based on the botanical defense were clearly very rare, the USDEA circulated an article in the summer of 1974 entitled The Federal Definition of Marijuana, a Response to Attack. Um, as you can see on the slide, I've got a clip here from the Freedom of Information request that I submitted to the DEA, which affirmed in this article the view that cannabis sativa and the definition of cannabis in the legislation is a question of law and not a question of fact for the jury. Unsurprisingly, the legislatures in the United States and around the world did not allow the criminal laws um, uh, to continue this way for much longer. They soon amended them to define cannabis at the genus level. Um, and additionally, with the movements for decriminalization in the decades afterwards, the popularity of the botanical defense declined. Now, although the legal issue seemed to be resolved um, for, because of these various factors, what I found is that the taxonomic controversy has not entirely resolved. As many of you know, I'm sure, um, in the public understanding of marijuana, there is, in the public understanding, a dichotomy between sativa and indica. Although, of course, um, many people understand this to be a dichotomy between different strains or varieties, rather than necessarily being differences between species. Nevertheless, some genetic research has also suggested that a polytypic view of the genus might be correct. Indeed, as we can see from this publication, uh, this picture taken from a publication in Nature, the polytypic concept based on Schultz's taxonomy uh, is still widespread to this day. On the other hand, though, when I spoke directly to botanists and visited Herbaria back in 2019 to do this research, what it seemed to me was that amongst botanists, the view is very much, or has either maintained or reverted to the monotypic view. The specimen that I have on the slide, for example, was one that I came across during a visit to the University of Arizona herbarium. It was labeled in the 1970s, as you can see, as cannabis indica. But by myself being there and pointing it out to the botanists at the herbarium, they conducted a review. And as you can see, by the time I was sent the photo, had determined that it was in fact a, spe um, a specimen of cannabis sativa subspecies indica, not a separate species from sativa. So that seems to be the prevailing view. And indeed, this is reflected in the filings that we see for plant breeders' rights around the world. But the reason why all of this controversy is quite interesting to me is the way that it has rippled through to the filings for plant patents over the last few years. As I mentioned at the outset, there's different forms of intellectual property available for plants. In the case of plant breeders' rights in the US and Canada, these are awarded by their departments of agriculture and those institutions have only awarded um, plant variety protection certificates for varieties within the category of cannabis sativa. There is no polytypic view that emerges amongst these rights. By contrast though, when it comes to patents in the United States, what we see is that those who have filed for these um, claims often adhere to the polytypic view of the genus. So I've extracted one example of a plant patent here. As you can see in the botanical description on taxonomy and nomenclature, they've adopted the view that there are three species of cannabis. Indeed, more recently, we even had an example where a plant patent was filed 
for what was identified as a cross between cannabis ruderalis and cannabis uh, and humulus lupulus. Um, the beer lovers and botanists um, in the room might recognize that humulus lupulus is in fact hops. Cannabis and um, humulus are closely related um, species within the same family. Um, and this plant pattern was for a variety that was a mixture between the two. So far in the United States, 29 plant patterns have been granted for cannabis varieties. And out of those 29, 20 of them take the polytypic view. So for one reason or another, it seems that amongst the breeders who are developing these varieties and at the US Patent and Trademark Office, the polytypic view is still um, often being accepted. And this is something that I think plant patent law and the cannabis industry will need to deal with this um, difference of opinions. Now to close out for today, and given this mention of plant patents, I want to now turn to the ayahuasca controversy. So this is the final case study that deals with a plant patent application that was filed by Lauren S. Miller in 1984. Um, and was granted in 1986 for a variety of Banisteriopsis carpi named Darvine. The key distinctive characteristic of the plant was described as the rose colour of its flower petals, which fade as the plant ages to near white in colour, which you can see in the colour photographs um, on the slide. Now, this was considered to be distinctive because, according to the applicant, all other flowers of this species tend to fade to yellow. Now, several years after it was granted, the divine plant patent began to receive criticism and has been widely cited in the literature since then as an example of biopiracy. The idea that intellectual property rights and a patent in particular are a key mechanism for the global north to exploit and appropriate traditional knowledge and biological resources from the global south. Now, in addition to raising awareness about biopiracy cases through protests and petitions, critics often successfully engage in formal opposition procedures at the relevant patent office. This requires them to strategically articulate their arguments um, against the grant of these intellectual property rights using the legal requirements for patentability rather than using ethical um, or moral concerns to oppose them. In doing so, they have often been able to get these patents uh, revoked or withdrawn. I mean, one famous example, a coalition of activist groups initiated opposition proceedings at the European Patent Office um, against a patent relating to the neem tree from the Indian subcontinent. And the patent was revoked on the grounds of inventive step in the year 2000. Now, the ayahuasca plant patent followed a similar pattern. Banisteriopsis uh, carpi, also known as the ayahuasca vine or yage, is a native plant from the Amazon region. It is important for Amazonian indigenous peoples as an essential ingredient in the ayahuasca brew that is prepared according to traditional techniques and used by shamans um, to develop have visions to interpret the ailments of their patients. The hallucinogen received attention and popularity in the United States during the 1960s through the work of folks like uh, Richard Evans Schultz and its promotion by activists like Timothy Leary. Now, despite the widespread consumption of the um, of ayahuasca by non-Indigenous peoples, Antonio Namihoy um, stated that only shamans are authorized to prepare the ceremonial drink made from the sacred plant, and no member of the community can drink it without the guidance of a shaman. Thus, when the coordinating body of indigenous organizations of the Amazon River Basin learned about this plant patent, they criticized the appropriation of the sacred symbol and expressed that they were unable to fathom how a plant known and cultivated by them throughout the rainforest since time immemorial for religious and medicinal purposes could have been discovered and patented by an outsider. Now, as with many biopiracy allegations, the opponents to the plant patent did not limit their efforts to the court of public opinion. A patent re-examination request was filed with the US Patent and Trademark Office in 1999. The ayahuasca case though differed from other biopiracy cases because it was the first and to my knowledge, the only case involving a plant patent. All the others have focused on utility patents. 
Thus, while the opponents were following a similar pattern that had been set during other biopiracy oppositions, they had to navigate the differences in the patentability criteria under the Plant Patent Act. Um, for today, I'm just going to focus briefly um, on how they argued that the variety failed on the grounds of novelty and distinctness using botanical evidence. Now, just briefly to make sure everyone's um, on the same page, the Plant Patent Act of 1930 um, says that a plant patent may be awarded to someone who invents or discovers and asexually reproduces any distinct and new variety of plant. The US case law affirms that in order for the new variety to be distinct, it must have characteristics which are clearly distinguishable from those of existing varieties. In the ayahuasca case, the opponents made the argument that novelty was destroyed because this supposedly new and distinguishing feature of the divine plant variety, that being the pink flowers which fade to white with age, was already described in a printed publication more than a year before the um, patent filing date. Specifically, they looked to dried specimens that were made available in herbaria in the United States and the botanical descriptions that accompanied them. In order to make this challenge, the opponents to the ayahuasca pat plant patent um, received support from Professor William A. Anderson, who was the director of the University Herbarium at the University of Michigan, and was a leading expert on the plant family Malpigiaceae, to which Banisteriopsis carpi belongs. He submitted testimony that the characteristics described in the plant patent were typical of the species as documented in prior art in the botanical records of major US herbaria which were available for public inspection before the um, patent application was filed. Specifically, they pointed to, um, in the re-examination request, to four um, taxonomic specimens that were available at the Field Museum of Natural History Herbarium and the University of Michigan Herbarium. Uh, on these um, four um, specimens, what they found were um, descriptions of the plants when they were still um, alive and before they had been affixed to the paper. On one of the um, specimens, which had been collected by Dr. Timothy Plowman from an individual plant in Florida, but had been grown from a cutting uh, collected in Ecuador in 1979, the accession sheet contained his notes describing the specimen as having flower buds that were deep rose pink, petals rose pink, the limb uh, fading to creamy white with age, the claw remaining pale pink. Another specimen that was also collected by Dr. Plowman in Florida contained notes that the specimen had flowers that are deep pink turning white with age. The opponents also referred to um, 12 written publications, including books written by Richard Evans Schultz and various texts on plant taxonomy and economic botany. Now, initially, the USPTO accepted that based on this prior art, the divine variety failed on novelty grounds. It had already been described in a printed publication or the herbarium specimens. And for that reason, the patent was rejected on the, in uh, 1999. However, Miller appealed and very briefly, um, before we wrap up, uh, I'll point out that he made this appeal based on an argument that the descriptions of the plants as they appeared in herbarium specimens were not relevant to the assessment of novelty because they failed to use the correct nomenclature for colors. He argued that Robert Ridgway's 1912 color standards and color nomenclature were the correct um, and were standard for botanical description. And since Dr. Plowman's observations of the ayahuasca plants did not use this language, um, they were not relevant, they were insufficiently precise um, or they were uh, worse inaccurate. Now, Professor Anderson wrote a declaration um, suggesting or arguing, in fact, that Ridgway's color um, nomenclature was not, in fact, the standard amongst botanists who collect flowering plants. But this declaration was not accepted by the USPTO because under the rules that um, were in force at the time, third parties were not able to um, submit this kind of evidence or declarations um, during um, subsequent examination of the patent. As a result, the USPTO did not take um, that testimony into account and held that color dictionaries were an essential aspect of botanical description. And since the herbarium specimens did not use this nomenclature, they could not be considered. 
For this reason, the, um, and some others, the board reinstated the patent in 2001, and this patent expired in 2003. So the question is, what have we learned? Well, briefly, I hope that with the cannabis case study in particular, we have seen something more of a co-productive relationship between law and botanical science, where changes that happened in the legal domain were highly influential and spurred activity amongst botanists and botanical science then fed back into legal decision-making um, and decisions by legislators. But what we also see though are moments where this relationship somewhat breaks down. In the case of the ayahuasca plant patent, the fact that the rules of procedure at the USPTO at the time meant that only some evidence, but not um, the written declarations by Professor Anderson um, could be taken into account, shaped their decision-making about um, the plant patent and whether it should be granted. I should say though, that we should not take this particular case study too far. Although it does represent a useful example of the pernicious effects of um, legal technicalities, the rules that meant that, that testimony was excluded have long since changed. And I would go so far as to say that the entire proceeding would have happened completely differently if it had happened under the new rules um, within the last decade. Nevertheless, even if case studies like this aren't perfectly representative of how law and science normally operate, I do think that such instances um, where the relationship between plant science and plant intellectual property don't work as um, we might want them to are analytically useful because they force us to ask questions about science and the law that we might have otherwise um, not considered. So I'll leave it there for now and um, open it up to what I hope are lots of questions coming through in the chat. Thank you. Thank you so much, Justin. That was absolutely fantastic. A totally fascinating talk. Really interesting from my perspective to see you know, how these legal questions are resulting in such fantastic and fascinating taxonomic debate as well, and actually how long that debate has been going on for. Um, we've got uh, a few questions in the Q&A, um, so I'll try to get to as many of them as possible. Um, we've got about 10 minutes left in our session, so hopefully we'll be able to get through um, a lot of them. And some of them I am going to group together a little bit because I think we've got a few people asking around the same thing. One of the questions which is coming up quite a bit, and actually it was the question I was going to ask as well, is around um, genomics, DNA data, and how that is potentially changing some of these questions which are coming up. Um, uh, one of our participants, and I apologise, I haven't got everybody's name in the Q&A. For some reason, Zoom is doing something slightly silly with names. Um, but one of the questions, um, which I think is particularly well-worded on this, is coming, um, these question, issues that you're describing are, by and large phenotypic um, so looking at the plant's form whereas obviously genetic analysis including full genome um, analysis is now becoming much more um, accessible much more usable with much better databases behind it are we seeing yet any um, legal cases coming through where genetic evidence um, is, is being used either full genome or better barcoding or is that something you think is likely to come next in some of these questions it's a great question. Um, so as I very, very briefly alluded to and kind of skipped over, um, I did come across a few genetic studies that were done of cannabis. And as I was trying to get across, what I had noticed that is that it seems like botanists had come to the view that the genus is monotypic. But genetics has almost reopened the question again that some of these studies, as well as chemical studies, um, are suggesting that perhaps the polytypic view might be correct. Again, there's obviously big debates here about what do we mean by a species and the role that genetics should play in that that I don't want to get into, but it does seem to be actually opening it up rather than helping to resolve it necessarily. Um, in terms of litigation, um, I'm not super hopeful that that will be the mechanism to help resolve it because plant intellectual property doesn't get litigated very often. And when it does, it's not necessarily going to be on these types of questions. So if anything, I think it's, to be perfectly honest, me just drawing attention to it, hopefully, and raising these questions might, I hope at least, force these questions to be brought up within the cannabis industry and amongst plant patent examiners um, and botanists as well to try and, to the extent that it's needed, have some kind of resolution about this question so that we have some level of consistency um, 
between plant breeders' rights and plant patents, for example. Not that I have you know, a stake in which way it gets resolved, to be honest, um, but it's a question that has not been answered. There's clearly still some confusion between plant patent applicants. Yeah, fascinating. Thank you. Um, yeah, so uh, just to run through some more of our questions um, in order. Um, Mike Dempsey's asked, is it now legal to grow cannabis satavia in the USA for fibre to be used in textiles? How does that work with the, the legislation? Yeah, so I think what this is getting at, um, and this is part of the reason why the um, plant IP claims for cannabis have suddenly spiked, is that in the US in 2018, they introduced something called the Farm Bill. This made plant breeders' rights available in the US, but it's very clear in its definition. And I think this partially explains actually why it is that um, amongst plant breeders' rights, they always use cannabis sativa. It's because the legislation specifies not just the species, but it's referring here to hemp, but also things like it must be cannabis that has you know, only certain levels of THC. It must be below a certain amount. So it's through those types of definitions um, that it has been restricted um, and confines the um, legality of growing it um, and producing those types of products to cannabis with low THC levels. Likewise, when you look through these um, IP claims, even for plant patents, they're not for the strong high THC um, marijuana strains. They're always for ones with very, very low THC levels that can be used for these more uh, industrial purposes. Okay. Thank you. Um, we've got a question regarding um, wild cannabis. Um, and how do you how do you legally control the use of, of wild cannabis, which is an intriguing one? Um, I think that's an interesting question. I'm not sure it's really one that I can answer. I'm sorry, that's a terrible answer to give, but maybe <laughs> it's, I can't really answer that at the moment. Um, so it would just depend on the jurisdiction and you know, how they conduct their law enforcement, really. Yeah, no, that's that's fair enough. Um, Right, just uh, running through some of these questions. So, yeah, so we've got a couple more coming through around um, the genomics one. Um, do you think it's likely that the uncertainty around cannabis taxonomy will need to be resolved, or is it possible this uncertainty will persist indefinitely in plant intellectual property applications? I mean, it could. Um, like I said, there haven't been any cases yet that have forced this question to be answered. Um, you know, applicants are being very strategic, but if they are wanting certain protections that are only afforded to hemp or cannabis sativa at the moment, that's what they say they are they are growing. Uh, whereas when it's more open for plant patents, they will, you know, go with whatever tax on me is the one that they understand to be the correct one. Um, I've also seen, sorry, a question just pop up around relevant publications. There is one of my own, um, I forgot to put my email on the slide. Um, I'll have it shared later. Um, you can email me if you can't get a copy of it, but I did publish an article just on the, the cannabis controversy in 2020 in the Griffith Law Review. It's called Before the High Court. Fantastic. Hopefully Padma will be able to share that that, uh, that link around. I'll, uh, I'll have to have a read later. Um, Mike's come back with a, another question. Um, is the USA plant patent the only type of patent which allows discoveries to be patented? Um, as far as I'm aware, yes. So the normal dogma that we have in patent law is that there's a big distinction that is made between what's an invention and what is a discovery, things that are you know, considered to be in nature and things that are made by man, so to speak. Um, obviously, in, within the realm of plant patents, this, is, this kind of breaks down a little bit, although the way the legislation tries to save it, if I go back um, in the slides, to show you is that it does have a restriction that if you've discovered a plant, it has to have been found in a cultivated area. So if you found it just walking through what's considered to be an uncultivated area, it cannot be patented. You have to bring it back um, and you know propagate it somewhere um, or grow it in a garden or something um, for it to be patentable. That's it. Thank you. Um, we've got a question here from Neville Squires. Um, if someone genuinely produces or uses a variety of a species, could the patent not be granted for the variety only and not for the genus? Similarly, could the intention for using the plants, for example, as a drug, be considered rather than the species, rather the, the species or the genus? Um, so if I'm understanding the question correctly, um, the intellectual property rights are granted for varieties. Mm -hmm. So when you get, you know, if I 
say I was the owner of the, the plant patent for um, Crips Pink or Pink Lady Apple, I can't stop everyone from growing other apples. It's just that particular variety that I have some control over. Um, so same with cannabis, it's only the particular variety and um, stopping people from um, selling and otherwise using its progeny. In fact, the way plant patent infringement, sorry to derail this slightly, is constructed is that even if you develop your own variety independently that has some of the same characteristics as mine, maybe the same THC levels or same leaf shape um, or flower structure, plant patent law has what we might consider for referring to copyright as a defensive independent creation. So if you develop separately with a um, different um, to germplasm, um, a different variety, that's completely fine. Um, I can't sue you for infringement just because it looks similar to mine if it's not in fact derived from mine. Mm. Thank you. Um, Naomi has asked, have there been any legal challenges from countries such as China where plants have been known by them and used by them, for example, medicinally, long before Western scientific plant classification began? Totally. Um, so this is, I mean, I didn't talk about it in much detail, but this whole idea of biopiracy, um, there's a huge amount of literature um, and commentary about it. Um, India in particular in the 90s and early 2000s was very active in this space in um, coordinating and supporting um, objections to patents that were seen to be taking um, traditional knowledge, um, everything from turmeric to um, yoga. Um, there were intellectual property claims being made in the United States um, and they helped to oppose them. Uh, but there's been cases from all over the world. The level of state support um, that comes um, during these um, biopiracy cases does vary quite a lot. Um, it's often indigenous groups themselves or environmental activists who are the ones identifying these biopiracy cases and raising awareness and opposing them. Um, but yes, certainly a lot of countries have taken measures, um, part of which is in accordance with some treaty obligations to protect traditional knowledge under the Convention on Biological Diversity. Um, so even in Australia, for example, we have some regulations that in theory seek to forestall this kind of um, appropriation of indigenous knowledge. Uh, likewise, India has protections, China has protections for traditional medicines. Um, but again, the way that states, depending on their you know, political moment, um, enforce these or advocate for them at the international level does vary quite a lot. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. So we're we're pretty much out of time, but I'm aware we've got a few um, questions um, just sort of popped in. I mean, I'm happy to stick around another couple of minutes unless the, it's going to kick us off Zoom. Um, um, yeah, yeah, okay, cool. So um, we'll try to get through, and apologies if I miss any here, because we are running short on time. Um, we've got a question um, come in. The driver for the legislation is the presence of the drug. Um, so the legislation is reacting to that. So why not draft the legislation to recognise this? I just purely a chemical test. Um, this would make fibre cultivation legal and cover any other plant somebody thinks of using another using another species or another genus um, for so could the could the legislation be purely on for example the presence of THC yeah so that's what things like the farm bill in the US and other legislation has done where they say we're not going to fully allow medicinal cannabis and um, you know recreational cannabis as well um, but rather having those requirements about the THC level setting it at a you know very minor level so that obviously there's going to be some THC in any cannabis, but you can get varieties that are where it's functionally um, absent and not going to be useful for drug purposes. And that's the type that gets legalized in some circumstances. Yeah. Um, and we've got a question which is um, perhaps again a little based on, on the US legal system here, but it appears that different courts are given different rulings in the US with cannabis being legalised. Surely cannabis is cannabis and should be legalised or not? What's your, what's your I mean, this, a lot of it just comes down to the fact that federalism is federalism and in countries like Australia and the United States where we have states with their own authority to you know, enact criminal laws, um, this is just one of the consequences that you don't get consistency um, in, even if we, you know, thinks if we think it's illogical, that's just how the system works, unfortunately. 
Thank you. And we've just got one last question, um, which might be out of your ever expertise because it's looking at Indian legislation um, rather than some of the legislation we've been talking about uh, so far today. Um, that's uh, referencing a lot of illegal growing um, of cannabis in, uh, in India. Um, it, are there routes to legal plantations in, in India or is that just down to the domestic legislation? It would really be the, the legal context in which they're being grown. I don't know anything about the cannabis regulations in India. I'm sorry. No, no, that's 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 fine. Thank you. Um, so I think we've we've I think I've got through all of the questions that people have uh, popped up. It's uh, sparked some really interesting questions and um, and yeah, absolutely fascinating talk. And we've got a number of comments. I think saying um, thank you uh, for such a fantastic talk um yeah really really looking forward uh, to uh, to reading your paper uh, when we get the link thank you get around thank um, you and like i said there is an earlier partial version of some of this with more detail about the earlier history of cannabis in that um, law review article i'll ask padma to send around the details um including my email for those who are paywalled um so that you can have a read of that and get a bit more background on that and like i said i'll let you know as well um, once this paper is finalised and hopefully published. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much uh, for a fantastic thank talk. You. And thank you everyone for coming along uh, to today's lunchtime lecture and hopefully we'll see you at another one soon. Thanks. Bye everyone.